Welcome to the Renaissance Church Podcast. Our mission is to glorify God and to make disciples by bringing the gospel into all of life in all the earth. This is Chris Kipp, lead pastor of Renaissance Church here in Richmond, Texas. And if you've not joined us in a worship gathering or at a house church yet, we would love to have you join us. You can find out more information at rin-church.org. And I pray that you are encouraged and edified by the proclamation of God's word today. Let's remain standing for the reading of the word. We're reading Ezra 8, 21 through 23. I proclaimed a fast by the Ahava River so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us, our dependents, and all our possessions. I did this because I was ashamed to ask the king for infantry and cavalry to protect us from our enemies during the journey since we had told him, the hand of our God is gracious to all who seek him, but his fierce anger is against all who abandon him. So he fasted and pleaded with our God about this, and he was receptive to our prayer. Skipping down to Ezra 8, 31 through 32. We set out from the Aha River on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. We were strengthened by our God, and he kept us from the grasp of the enemy and from ambush along the way. So we arrived at Jerusalem and rested there for three days. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. Thank you, Jordan. What do you do when you're in between a rock and a hard place? That's what I want to talk about. What do you do when you're in between a rock and a in a hard place. We just heard from Ezra chapter eight. This is the fourth week. Is that right? Third week? Fourth week. I'm losing track of time. I think it's the fourth week of our series called Hungry for God. And what we're looking at is moments in scripture where there was a call for communal prayer and fasting because we're about to step into a season uh, called Awaken Houston. We're joining with churches around the city for a time of prayer and fasting. And we're asking God to do some very, very wonderful things in our lives, in our church, but in our city, in our community. And we believe that Prayer and fasting is, is a, a weapon, a spiritual weapon that God has given to his church where we are, we are calling on him to do the kingdom works that only he can do. And so we're excited to step into that. Um, and we're uh, in Ezra chapter 8 today. And here we have Ezra, who is this, uh, this man who is in exile. It's now the Persian Empire. And Nehemiah has gone back to build the wall. If you know the story of Nehemiah and how he, he gets all these exiles to go back and to build this wall. We have um, two other men. We have uh, Zerah, Babel, and Jeshua. And they've gone back to rebuild the temple. And it's not quite as glorious as the original temple. In fact, when they laid the foundation, some of the elders that were there had who, who remembered the previous temple were weeping. So there's this weird sound of weeping and rejoicing at the same moment. So we have structures of of the Jewish people have been rebuilt, but now someone needs to go back and rebuild society. And God sends not a carpenter, not a stonemason. God sends a teacher. That's what Ezra was. Ezra was a man who had this, this crazy amount of favor on his life, is, is what we learned from, from the previous chapters of the book of Ezra. And he was someone who was skilled in the law, and he had the favor of the king, and he was a teacher. Now, by the way, if you're a teacher here, did you know that teachers are the ones that rebuild societies? It's amazing. So God sends a teacher, and, and we have... Ezra, who has talked up the God of Israel. He's told the king, you know, how amazing this God is, how all-powerful, that he's the king of kings, that he's the God of gods. And he's talked him up to the point where the king is going to give Ezra and these exiles 20 to 30 tons of silver, gold, and bronze and to send it back as an offering because he wants to make sure that he's okay with that God, the God of gods. Like, I, I want to be good with him, so here, take this, this whole bunch of treasure, 20 to 30 tons. But here's the thing. 
Ezra is between a rock and a hard place because if he goes to the king and says, um, can you send an army with us? The king will say, well, if your God is the God of gods, why can't he protect you on the way? And if they go without an army to protect them and they get robbed, then again, he'll say like, isn't your God supposed to be the God of gods? Like, why did you get robbed along the way? So Ezra is in this moment where his faith has backed him into a corner. Have you ever felt like that before? Like you, you've just sort of been backed into the corner by life and you're in between a rock and a hard Place. That's where Ezra is because he's about to take 20 to 30 tons of gold, silver, and bronze and a bunch of people. And they're going to walk through like uh, gang controlled neighborhoods, basically. And the, the possibility of being robbed along the way is very high. And so Ezra is in between the rock and the hard place. I was thinking about the rock and the hard place that you and I sometimes find ourselves. There's the menial one, and parents, you'll, you'll know this. It's like when one kid needs to be one place and the other kid needs to be another place at the same time, but there's no one else to drive, and you have one car and one person, you're like, how am I going to do all this, right? There's the, the, the little ways that we find ourselves there. There's the, maybe the bigger ways in parenting where we, uh, we know that we need to guide our children, we need to direct them, and so we're going to sort of direct them, we're going to push them in a direction that we know is the right thing to do, but we don't want to push so hard that we push them away, and so we're kind of in this limbo, this rock in a hard place moment. It could be in marriage, right? It's like your, your faith tells you, like, I'm committed to this person to the end. Like, we stood before our families and our God and said, till death do us part, but we're also hitting this issue, and I have no idea how we're going to get over this. It's like you're, you're cornered by your faith between a rock and a hard place. It could be pressures in school, pressures at work, and they feel insurmountable, and you can't quit but you don't know how you're going to overcome this, this obstacle, and you just feel stuck between a rock and a hard place. There's the decisions that you need to make, but there's no like clear, obvious, right, good decision. It's like this has some problems, and this has some problems, and I have to choose one of them. And I just feel stuck between a rock and a hard place. Well, here's what we could do about it is we could do nothing, just be paralyzed by like, uh, indecision, right? We could scheme and manipulate, right? We, we could get in there and try to make something happen. We could try to control some situations and, and, and you know, get the outcome that we think we want. We could be dishonest. Or we could do what we're best at, which is just worry about it, right? We're really good at that, really good at worrying. But Ezra does something different. Is he's in between a rock and a hard place. Ezra calls for fasting and prayer. When he's stuck, when he doesn't know what to do, he says, let's fast and let's pray. And here's what he does. Is he makes a very specific request Jordan read it for us in verse 21, and here's what Ezra says. I proclaimed a fast by the Ahava River so that we might humble ourselves before our God and ask him for a safe journey for us. Now, if you grew up around the church, around Christianity, there were certain token prayers that you learned. One of the prayers is at dinner time, you say, God is great, God is good, let us for this. You know that prayer, right? That's a token prayer. 
We, we know that one. It's an easy one. We can all say it. Another prayer was this. When you're going on a journey, someone says this, Lord, we pray for safe travel, right? Y'all prayed that prayer? And you're kind of like, yeah, you know, we've got airbags now and we've got, you know. It, it, for us, safe travel on like nicely paved roads and fairly, you know, mechanically solid vehicles and, and all the stuff that we have here, it just feels like a token prayer sometimes. But I just want to remind you of what Ezra's facing is he's going to carry 20 to 30 tons of treasure through the hood. And he's praying, God, please get us there safely. Some of you have felt that way as you've gone through certain parts of town. You're like, oh, dear Jesus, right? Get me through here safely. And here's what I want us to notice. Is that Ezra gives a very specific request of God. And as we step into this, uh, this awakened Houston uh, period of, of time, what, what I w- want to challenge you to do is to get very specific with God. A- as you engage in whatever you're feeling led by the Spirit to pray or to fast, here's what I, I want to call us to, is that we would get really, really, really specific about our request because just like Ezra, we could get paralyzed by fear and we could scheme, we could wring our hands and worry, but what if we just said, let's fast, let's pray, and let's get really, really specific. And there's some things that happen when we do that. Here's the first thing. Specific requests rightly identify God as the source, capital S source, of all things. When you get specific with God, it it helps you to remember who's actually in charge of everything. And it connects us with the source. Uh, When we first planted this church, I remember walking around the yard. Uh, I was push mowing my yard. I have the smallest, cheapest push mower I could find at Walmart, okay? And it takes me five bazillion hours to mow my grass because the mower is so small. I have to do so many turns around the yard. And I'm a little bit of a perfectionist, okay? So there's that problem too. And we had planted the church and we were, you know, financially strapped. We had... We had spent most everything that we had to move here to fix up this house that we had purchased that was in need, and we'd moved into that house, and I'm, I'm in that, that feeling of like, I need more money, and I need more time, and I don't have either one. Have you ever felt that way before? It's like, I need to make more money, but I don't have time to make any more money. In fact, I got to get some things off my plate. So this is the American dream. How do I do less and make more, right? Like, that's what I'm thinking, And here's the thing is in my mind, as I'm push mowing around this yard, I start thinking about like, how many dollars would that be? So I've got my tiny little red mower. I'm pushing around the yard. I've got three hours to think about this. And so I'm just going around the yard like this and I'm just calculating like, how much would that be? And I came up with this specific number in my head. And so here's what I did for the next like year or so as I'm push mowing that yard, I just started praying for a specific number very, very specific number. Why? Because I knew at the end of the day, God is the source of all things. He's the source. And I'm in between this rock and a hard place. I don't have more time and I, and I don't know how to make more money right now. I need to give more time to this church plant that we're starting. I'm in between a rock and a hard place and I'm just saying, Jesus, could you please just provide this. Could you please, and I'm just praying this over and over again as I'm walking around the yard for a year. I I have this book that I've been going through called The Praying Life. If you've never heard of this book, it's by Paul Miller. I highly recommend this book. It's going to encourage you greatly, and it's going to help you pray. It's going to help you pray very childlike, wonderful, bold prayers. And here's what Paul Miller talks about in the book. 
he has made cards for every one of his family members that he carries with him. And so he has a card and it has all the names of the people in his family because he found this, that when he was parenting, he says it took him about 17 years to realize that prayer was the answer to his parenting. And so he would, he would get, you know, his son would, would, you know, exemplify a certain character or behavior and he would, you know, get angry and he would have this, you know, this big thing and it's like, it just never improved anything. And so here's what he decided he was going to do is he was going to take that card and he was going to write specifically what he was going to pray for for us. And so, for example, one, one thing he shares is that he was going to pray for humility in one of his children because he said he just needs humility. And six weeks later, his son calls him on the phone and says, Dad, I've just been thinking, I'm just so prideful. And I, I'm just realizing, like, I need humility. He just got super, super specific because he realized the answer for every one of his family members was not him losing his temper or trying to control or manipulate or all that kind of stuff. He knew that God had to do something on the inside of that person. He had to ask for something very, very specific. In the book, he says, even those little things about maybe, you know, your family member that annoys you, he's like, just write it on the card and just pray over that specific request. Now, that's for a different church in a different place. Obviously, none of y'all are annoyed by any of your family members. Praise God for that. It helps us remember who the source is, that we serve the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. We serve the God who created everything that we experience and know, who created the cosmos that we're, we're just with telescopes beginning to see more and more of. We serve the God who, who made the, the microorganisms all the way to the biggest, hairiest animals on the planet, right? He's the God of all things, who, who makes the rains come in season, who, who, who moves upon the hearts of people. He is the capital S source of everything. But it's not just that we recognize him as source. We recognize him as father. And that's so important. It glorifies God when you pray specific requests to him. Jesus said it this way, ask anything in my name and surely it, it will be done for you. What? Ask anything in my name and surely it will be done for you. Do you hear the audacious invitation of Jesus for specific requests? And he would use examples. Oh, there was a widow. And she, she wanted um, justice. And so she went to the judge and she demanded justice. And he brushed her off. And so she came back every day demanding justice over and over again. And eventually it wore him out. And he said, okay, I'll help you out. Do you believe that your God is an unjust judge who doesn't care about you, who brushes you off? His point was this. I want you to ask, and I want you to ask repeatedly, and I want you to ask very, very specifically, and know that you have a God who's better than that. He's your father. He's the source. And it glorifies him when you pray specific requests. The second thing that it does for us is that it, specific requests help us locate God's activity in our lives. It helps us locate God's activity. In verse 23, we, we have this, this moment where it says, we fasted and pleaded with our God about this, and he was receptive to our prayer. I love that. It's like they're, they're fasting and they're praying and there's something, there's like a release or something on the inside of Ezra that knows like he's heard us. He's receptive to our prayer, but he knows that God's receptive to the prayer because of what we read in verse 31 when it says, we set out from the Ahava River on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. We were strengthened by our God and... He kept us from the grasp of the enemy and from ambush along the way. 
And Ezra knows people who travel this road without protection, they have trouble. His faith said, God's in control. He can do it. His flesh said, let's get a gun, right? And he knows God's been receptive to our prayer because he got us there. Here's the point. When you're praying specific things, you begin to see God's activity in your life because you've been asking for something so specific that when it happens, you're like, that must be God. That must be God. In certain circles that I've been in the past, um, certain church types of, you know, types of churches, one of the questions that people would ask you was, what's God teaching you right now? Have you ever heard that question before? You've been with somebody? What's God teaching you with right now? And there's something in you that's like, oh, that's a nice question, but it also feels a little bit icky at the same time because you're like, like, what, like, it, is there a right answer or a wrong answer to this question? Like, I feel like I'm being trapped right now. Like, what do you say to this, to answer this question? And here's the reality is that sometimes we kind of feel a little bit bad because we don't have, we have no idea, right? Like, well, I'm, I'm, I believe in Jesus. I worship him on the daily. I'm trying to follow him as best I can. You know what I'm saying? But I think the other reason why we, we feel a little bit bad when we hear that question is because maybe we haven't been asking for anything specific. And so we have no way to locate his activity in our lives. When Paul Miller's son calls him six weeks later, and he has written on a card that he keeps with him, I'm praying for a humility for my son. And he calls him and says, I feel like I'm so prideful and I need to be more humble. He can look at that and be like, Jesus is alive and well, risen from the grave, and he's at work in planet Earth. I know it because I pray for something very specific. And look what the Lord has done. He was able to locate the activity of God because he's praying for very, very specific things. <laughs> When, uh, when I'd been praying around the lawn for a year, specific request, a certain number, the following year at tax time, we, you know, we're doing all our, getting all our records together, and I look at our income, and it was what I had prayed for in just, just a little bit more. What had happened was, Casey was subbing here at this school and she went into the office one day and she saw the office workers and thought, I'd really like to work in an office. Like, I I love this. She goes immediately, she's like, I should look online on their website to see if there's any job openings. There's a job opening with the principal that she knows personally and it's like just the doors open and all of a sudden like God provided for our family in this this way that I'd never even thought of before and he provides the exact thing that I've been praying for and when it happened at that text time I'm looking I'm like oh, Jesus you're alive and well on planet earth and you are working. You have heard our prayer. I can locate his activity. If we're honest, we're prone to chalk things up to coincidence or to human effort. But praying specific requests, it, it just helps us to get through those, those sort of things fleshly ideas that we have and to see the activity of God in our life. Now, you know this, but I'll just say it anyway. Praying a specific request does not mean that God's going to do exactly what you want when you want him to do it. Did you know that? Right? We're not like arm twisting God of like, well, I fasted. That was hard. I was really hungry. Okay, I was kind of grouchy, but I tried to be nice, right? That was hard. You owe me, God. No, 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 no. No. That's not how it works. Fasting is a humbling of ourselves to say, just as like my body depends on food, my whole life depends on you. You're it for me. You're the source, Jesus. You're the one for me. There's nothing else like you. And I'm just demonstrating my absolute dependence on you. And I really need you to move here, God. I really need you to move. And he might just answer that request in some crazy way that you had no idea about. 
Paul Miller shares a story about his daughter. She's special needs, um, has to have a, uh, a computer that she, she talks through because of her, her handicap. And she would wake up in the middle of the night and she would start pacing in the hallway and it would wake them up in the middle of the night. And he would go upstairs and he'd get so frustrated. He's like, lay down and go back to sleep, right? And he would just do what parents do when your kids wake up in the middle of the night or we get really frustrated. And so one day, because he writes books about prayer, he's thinking about prayer all the time, he decided, he's like, you know, maybe I should pray about that. And so whenever she'd wake up, he'd get up and he'd get over his frustration. He'd say, Lord Jesus, please help my daughter sleep all the way through the night. Well, six months later, they move. And in the move, he realizes that there were diesel trucks across the street from their, their old house. And whenever they would pull in in the middle of the night, it would wake up his daughter. And the new house they moved to was just set back from the street enough to where she wouldn't be woken up anymore. And she was sleeping through the night. And he looked at his card and he was like, sleeping through the night, check. And God answered the request in a way that he never would have thought of. They had to move locations. So we're just inviting the activity of God so that we can locate it. The third thing that happens, and this is, this is so transformative for us, is that specific requests exchange our worries for God's strength. Oh, friends, this is powerful stuff. When the thing, when you're in between the rock and the hard place and you don't know what to do except just to kind of spin your mind on it and worry and try to think about how you're going to solve it and all that kind of stuff. When we stop that long enough to begin to form a specific request to God, it's like there's this transfer that happens where we, we lay out our worries before God and his strength comes back to us. We exchange it. For God's strength, there's a, a book called Managing Leadership Anxiety I've told you guys about. It's a powerful book. It's by Steve Cuss. And he says that, you know, in that place where um, the place between not knowing what to do and knowing you need to do something, right? You, the rock in the hard place, I, I need to do something. I don't know what to do. He said, that's the place where anxiety likes to come fill. That's where it comes to us. And the thing about anxiety is he says it's really more of a spiritual force, that there's, there's the, the, the part of your being where you're aware of the presence of God, okay? If you're, if you're a born-again follower of Jesus, you, you know what I'm talking about. There's a, there's a place in you where you know when you're in the presence of God, where you, you sense his nearness. There's an awareness of God. He said that's the exact space that anxiety comes to fill, and it's like an either or. It's like when you're so anxious, you have zero awareness of God. But when you're full of the awareness of God, anxiety begins to kind of push out of you, right? It's just sort of this place inside of us. And, and here's what he says. Anxiety shrinks the power of the gospel because it presents a false gospel. One of self-reliance rather than reliance on God. The gospel of self-reliance is always bad news because it always leads to more anxiety. What he's saying is it's a cycle, right? You, you begin to think, it's all about me. I've got to make everything happen. The world's on my shoulders. And then you begin to spin down in your thoughts and you become more anxious and more anxious and more anxious. And here's the thing, and you know that you've heard this before. If you know how to worry, then you know how to pray. Have y'all heard that before? If you know how to worry, you know how to pray. Because worry is faith in a bad outcome. Prayer is faith in the God over all the outcomes. And so when we come to God and we exchange our worry, like Ezra, who's, who's so concerned about this trip that he's going to make, when, when we come and say, no, no, let's stop, let's pray, let's fast, let's seek God, let's invite him into this. It's like something happens, like he said, God strengthened us. God strengthened us. In Philippians 4, Paul says it this way, don't worry about everything or anything. You, don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, get this phrase, 
Present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The word guard, it's, it's in, their, in, in their language, it was the symbol of a garrison of troops. So if you're living in a town and there's a threat of attack, when there was a garrison of soldiers there, it was like the presence of strength in a place that felt very insecure. Does that make sense? It, it's a picture of a garrison. He's like, in the place where you feel insecure, where, where you feel worried, where you feel anxious, where you're, where you're constantly rehearsing the what if, what if, what if. In that place, if, if you will turn that, re- that into a request to your God, just trade it in. Don't worry about anything. Trade it in. And the peace of God will guard your hearts. It's like strength is going to come to you. God has this power of turning our worries into strength when we turn those things into specific Request It reconnects us to the strength and the peace of God. And just as Ezra is bringing people and treasures from exile into, the, into Jerusalem, their, their promised place, Jesus has come to carry us into the promised place with the Father. If Jesus can handle bearing the sin of the world, right? If he could take what we just sing about through his blood and and wash away everything we've ever done before, right? If he could die on a cross and raise from the dead three days later in victory, then I think that maybe, just maybe, he can handle whatever it is that's stressing you out. Whatever makes you feel like you're in between a rock and a hard place, Maybe it's that parenting issue, that marriage issue, that relationship problem, the school or work pressure, the decision that you need wisdom for, the illness, the, the praying around the yard for a certain like financial number. It's like whatever it is, Jesus can handle it. And so... Today, I want to call us to make very, very specific requests of God. Um, I've been watching the latest season of The Chosen. Have y'all seen that, The Chosen? Yeah? It's, season three is out right now. I think today is like the, the, uh, the premiere of the season finale, I think, for this season. And the last two episodes have been really, really cool. Um, it's the healing of the woman who had an issue of bleeding in, in, in Jairus' daughter. So it's a beautiful portion of scripture in there. I mean, the chosen is fantastic. And um, the disciples are sitting there. John's disciples have come. They want to have, a, you know, have this question for Jesus. And they're like, we don't know where he is. We don't know when he's coming. So they're sitting along this dusty street. And they're just hanging out, and then all of a sudden, all these people start kind of running through the streets kind of excitedly, and they're carrying children, they're, they're helping lame people or blind people out to the street, and they're like, what's going on? And here's what they said, he's here. He's here. Another place in scripture is um, when Jesus, in the book of Revelation, he gives a letter to the angel of the church at Laodicea. And this was a church that was very, very wealthy, kind of like Americans. And um, it was a lukewarm church. We we were joking when we came in today because this is the time of year when um, the AC can't figure out like what to do, right? Your house is like muggy because it's like, well, the heater doesn't want to come on, but the AC doesn't want to come on because it's like right in that in-between. And you get that muggy feeling. It's like that lukewarm feeling that makes you really, really kind of frustrated. That's what Jesus says about the church at that moment. He's like, you're just hot. You're not hot or you're cold. Or, or cold. You're, just, you're just in this like lukewarm place. I want to vomit you out of my mouth. But here's, here's what he said to them. For you say I am rich and have become wealthy. And this was the phrase that got me and you need nothing. 
And I was just thinking about the difference between people hurriedly carrying every specific request they had into a street because he's here. In a church that is sitting in their laziness and slothfulness and saying, we don't need anything. And Jesus says, you're naked, blind, poor, and wretched. You don't even realize how much you need. And you need to come and buy gold from me, refined in the fire. He's inviting them to get very, very specific about their needs. And so, he's here, friends. He's here. Jesus is here. The resurrected Messiah that people were carrying their blind friends to and their lame friends to and their children they couldn't figure out. He's here. That same Jesus is here right now. He is alive. He is in our presence. He is gathered with us. He's here. And here's what I want to call us to. We're going to do something a little bit different today. We're not going to have communion. We have some prayer request cards on the altar that have the Awaken Houston uh, logo on them. And I made these for us because what I want us to do is just, in this, in this response time, is I want you to come down, and where well, there's pens here if you need one, and I want you to grab a card, and I just want you to write something very, very specific, whatever it is. In fact, no one has to know about it. It could be so, so vulnerable for you to even write it on the paper. Maybe it's that thing that you're dealing with in, in, your, in your family, right? That relationship, that thing in your marriage, that, that thing at work, that, that financial burden, whatever it is that is for you right now, I just want you to come and I want you to, to, to get very, very specific and I want you to put that in your Bible and over this Awaken Houston time, I want you to get very, very specific in your request to God. And here's what we're going to do is we're going to locate his activity in our lives. That at the end, you're going to say, wow, he's alive. He's real. He's moving in the earth. And he's heard my prayer. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Renaissance Church Sermon Podcast. To support our work, you can like, share, subscribe, or you can donate at rin-church.org.